Turks against Arabs, Arabs against Iranians, Iranians against this, this against that, Sunni against Shia, Shia against uh, uh, Christian, Christians in division among themselves. And therefore, we have to start a process of de-escalation and start the process of re-understanding the diversity and its enrichment and how much it means to us all over. And the Quran is very clear that we are we are not going to be able to get the people 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 to get misused and used against us in this kind of sectarian division. I give you a quick example on this. Iran and its allies, both Sunni and uh, Shia, but largely because of sectarianism, it is seen as a Shia power, is the main opponent to, to Israel today whether we like it or dislike it, whether you think the Shia are real Muslim or you don't think they are real Muslim, as some claim that they are, uh, they are not, and so on. And, and, and every day you read things and going on in Lebanon, in Syria, in Iraq, in Yemen, who is the real Muslim, what kind of Islam is the proper Islam, and so on. And so, but in terms of we have to bring all our potential power together. We are doing the very opposite of it. At the ethnic level, at the religious level, at the economic level, at the nation state level, if, if there is a nation state, it's a fiction, there's no nation state, at least in our, uh, and so on. And therefore, sectarianism has been misused. We have to put it back you know, we have to put the differences back on track and accept it that it is different differences between re interpretations of Islam, understanding of Islam, and so forth and so on. Very quick uh, things. We have, I've been trying to work on this a lot, you know, about, uh, you know, Sunni Shia, uh, Muslim, Christian, and so forth and so on. But the parameters, you know, has not worked. Because, as you mentioned, uh, it is, the difference is now part of some state's propaganda. You know, it is being worked out. I, I bo I'm born in a very strict Sunni uh, co small community in Lebanon, Tarish Didi, you know, very, it's considered the center of Sunnism. I never heard in my life about that the Shia are not Muslims. I never heard it till these days, later on, you know. Uh, my, my grandfather was a sheikh, and I'm a sheikh, unfortunately, you know. But uh, we, we never heard that, you know, that Al-Azhar, I studied Al-Azhar. We were never told that Shia are not Muslims, you yes. know. Uh, we, uh, I, even their uh, the doc, uh, doctrines and so on are taught at Lazar as uh, you know a fifth uh, school of thought and so on. this uh, uh, you know the wealth of this nation disappeared and therefore we are not able to empower ourselves anymore. Hiba wants to follow. Yeah, I yeah. want to ask you a personal question, actually. Personal? Being a Lebanese. Unmarried. You know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not proposing, right? Yeah. Um, In case. Be, be, no. Being a Lebanese. Being a Lebanese. Yes. Yani, I went to Lebanon, but after, only after the, 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 yani, the civil war has ended. But during the civil war, and all the experiences, and the face-to-face -face sort of uh, hostilities, and the memories, how did you deal with it? Uh, and what are the lessons that can be drawn from the early civil war in Lebanon experience to help Lebanon now manage a rising sectarian sort of uh, trend? Look, very briefly, very briefly. I tell you the truth, the war in Lebanon was between, at that time, the Muslim community, especially the Sunni, against the Christian community, especially the Maronite. The conflict today is not about the Sunni and the Christian, the conflict today is Sunni Shia. Mm -hmm. This, you know, what was the motor 
And it was about the Palestinian uh, cause, about other issues, you know, more than a strict Lebanese issue. Today we forgot the war and the, you know, uh, agreement to solve the civil war that we had, and we went into another conflict, you know, both the, what happened, you know, the Iranian revolution, the Afghani war, started this new process all over the Arab world, including Lebanon, given that Hezbollah's main base and power uh, is in Lebanon. Unfortunately, the Sunni community, my community, is used against the resistance for nothing. For no, no, not the Sunni will win, not the Shia will win. Israel will win. This is what has been my argument. Four years ago, I went to Al Jazeera, or three years ago, and there was somebody, uh, a Syrian uh, opposition figure, I don't mean, no, I, I, uh, is tamed now, uh, and we had a long session, uh, Al Jazeera was with his name, uh, المعاكس هذا هذا المخشخش الخط المعاكس شو اسمه؟ قاسم 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 and I was telling the man next to me the war was not yet started I told him look learn him from what we happened in Lebanon we, we destroyed each other Lebanon was down to the ground the capital was divided and 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 after Lebanon is a small country, 4 million. At that time it was 2.5 million. And we had 125,000 uh, dead and 900 maimed and injured in half of the population. So learn from this. You have to sit with Al-Assad talking. He said, I'm going to crush your head and crush the head of Al-Assad and crush this. I'm telling you, don't fight. Lui, what, do you, what, do you, what do you think? And at the end of the program, I want to hear he put water on me. He threw water Whoa. on me. <laughs> you know, it's he emotions. didn't want to argue. It's you emotions, know. no longer rational. On the same yes. issue? Yes. Well, I mean, to me, really, this um, reflects a serious problem with our consciousness as, as Arab Muslim people. You know, we, we are lacking there. Um, to me, to, I mean, these are historical conflicts that took place a long time ago. They don't relate to our times, uh, the Shia-Sunni conflict. Of course, you know, in Syria, we always have Shia community, we have Christian community, we, have, we had the Jewish community until those, you know, Ba'athists came to power. Um, and so our society is open to diversity. It's not about sectarian differences. It's about sectarianism. It's about the use of those differences to instigate one community to, to, against the other. And I think the only way to overcome this is to have reasonable people from both sides try to come up with a synthesis, you know, to, over, to, to transcend, you know, all those differences. Because Islam is not about being Sunni or being Shia. Um, and one can be critical of both sides, really. I, I, I myself, as, you know, a formal Sunni uh, Muslim, I'm critical of both. Um, there, are, there are things to be learned from both communities and there are things to be shunned in, two, in, in both communities which tells me that we need to forge a new understanding, new insight, new consciousness. And when that happens, then I think those, those you know, political um, manipulators on both sides will not be able to work. I mean, look at currently what we have. Definitely it is, it's a struggle between, initially, between uh, the, 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 the Gulf countries, supported by, of course, instigated maybe by, by the United States against this new revolution in Iran. But, um, and many people in the Sunni community thought that the Iranians would be wiser. But now what we have discovered really is that the leadership there, particularly the religious leadership, you know, this institution of al mushid is the heart of the sectarian uh, conflict that we, f we find in Syria. Um, I, you know, at the moment when we have the president become really the, the most powerful person politically in the country, the elected by the people, 
then I think we will be able to overcome this instigation by, 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 by sectarianism, by the Shia community. Uh, people argued in front of me many times from, from that community that, well, I mean, we, we didn't want the regime to do this, um, but we had to come and support it when outsiders. I know this is not the true, the true narration. But I always ask, why didn't you ask that person to, to, to mend fences with the opposition? The opposition was open to, to reconciliation. It was the regime that refused to reconcile. And this, this claim about imperialism, you know, it is untrue. I know I was from day one active with the opposition. The Americans didn't want to help us. Of course, the problem of the opposition is that of different minds. And many people continue to believe that the Americans were just delaying uh, things that they will support eventually. I didn't believe that. Um, and so, to make the, the long story short, I think the issue today is not, neither to say, well, uh, who, whose fault? The problem is that sectarianism stems from certain political forces, and those forces have to be confronted. And the people who should do that in the first place would be the intellectuals. You know, our intellectuals are silent. Starting with the leftists or the nationalists, um, even sometimes Islamists are silent when they have to speak. And so what we hear always from both sides are those radical voices. I remember I, I authored with this uh, a good friend of mine, Ahmed, uh, a book called Azmat al-Muthaqqaf al-Arabi. Remember that? About 20 years ago. And I think Today, I see a deeper crisis of that, of that muthaqqaf because we are not able to hear those voices and not able to have uh, intellectual speaking to the people rather than to okay. speak to states. Fair well. I, uh, to and move I think on that's so where we, we have to Everybody to equal go. opportunity. Mujib, uh, do you have any comment before we move on? Is it on the subject of sectarianism? Uh, if or? you have a brief think about it, and then we'll move on. Um, I think I, I agree with you that there's, we have to examine this at different levels, and, but also understanding that they're interlinked. So there is definitely a domestic level uh, which politics takes place, and uh, people do have agency at the local level. Um, but it's not all um, self-inflicted wounds as Fouad Ajami or Bernard Lewis would have it. Um, there is not a single conflict in this region in which um, the United States, for example, or Russia uh, uh, now as well in... in, in, in as, <laughs> well, yeah, well, France not in, in the Maghreb more so, but yeah, France has ambitions for Syria, definitely, um, though it's not as active, but that they're not also involved in. Um, so I think um, uh, it's the sort of intersection of these external as well as the local um, uh, politics and then how they're exploited um, that we have to look at. Um, but the broader solution, I think, you know, is we often get stuck on ideology and, and, and we think that these conflicts are really essentially about disagreements about uh, uh, the rightly guided khulafa and you know and who, who has should succeed the prophet uh, um, uh, uh, let alone other esoteric things but um, if you uh, I think we miss the picture that a lot of it has to do with um, the failure of economic and political development in the region. And we would not see these kinds of conflicts if we had industrialization, if we had socioeconomic And foreign development. interference? Yeah, and but, but the foreign interference is designed to prevent that, right? And it's designed to maintain that fragmentation. But, um, but what I'm saying is that um, uh, there's something to be said for looking at how that kind of socioeconomic development would have forestalled a lot of these kinds of issues that we're fighting. The last part of this segment, Francois, uh, we're talking about Syria. Uh, can you comment about Yemen and how that sectarian came about? You lived many years in Yemen, and there wasn't that kind of open hostility and sectarianism. Do you see this basically because of political development or foreign intervention and interference, or how, or, or, or even uh, outside interference? How do you how do you assess it? How do you see it? Thank you. Let's before all remind the specificity of Yemen. I like to wrap the specificity of the history of Yemen by quoting uh, one of the leaders, he, he happens to be one of the leaders of, uh, 
of Tagamo uh, Yemeni Lirislah, let's stay close to Ikhwan Muslimin, and he says something really nice. He says, you know, Francois, the Islamists in the entire Ummah Arabia, they have tried to reintroduce Islam in the constitutions at a time when we in Yemen, we have introduced constitution inside Islam. So, you know, the, the historic framework is completely different since there was no colonial power when you, lousy Ottomans, left Yemen in 1911. There was no Western power. So there's been, you don't have this alchemy of reacting negatively uh, to so-called Western modernity. Modernity came through the Arab visitors during this period. So this has to be kept in mind. If you move to 1990, 1990 is the beginning of the civil war in Algeria. In Yemen, Yemen has moved beyond the sectarian divide between Sunni and Shia, which was the base of, the, of several revolutions, but the, the, the well, to make it short, the imama uh, regime in Yemen was a sectarian regime. I mean, it allowed the, the Zaidi to be imam and not the Sunni, okay? So the revolution went against this divide. And the re Republican revolution allowed every citizen, abolished the, the divide. And you have two heroes of Yemen, uh, Zubairi, and uh, who helps me? Uh, Ahmed Mohammed Nu'aman. One was a Shia, the other was a Sunni. They shook hand and they reconciled the, 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 the political fabric of Yemen. So in 1990, you had a Yemen who was at the forefront of political, let's call it liberalization or modernization, whatever you want. Uh, but uh, they had a parliament, they had the Islamist sharing power and they had completely abolished the sectarian divide and the proof is that the the sunni the 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 the, the main opposition party tagamo el islam close to ikhwan al muslimin their leaders they were zaidis so the shia were leading the party of ikhwan al muslimin so this is the proof that they were far away from what was poisoning the rest of the landscape of the area. They were pioneers. How do you see the, you see the future? And, well, let me say, how did it start? Uh, and I, I wrote many times, I said, he who brought in uh, the poison of sectarianism in, the, in Mashhad CAC in Yemen is Ali Abdullah Saleh. Mm -hmm. Is the one, if you summarize, I will not do it, it would take too long, but Ali Abdullah Saleh has done everything to divide his society, you know. When the Houthi started saying, hey, uh, you, uh, you vicious, you submitted to the US in, in, in the cold case, uh, he, he responded, you lousy uh, Shia, <laughs> you are agents of Iran. And it had nothing to do at that time. So, now, uh, we are in the worst situation. What is the way out? The way out is going back to negotiation. Believe me, as a researcher, I try to, to be away from uh, uh, advertising uh, uh, one side or the other. I hate, but I must say, I hate what the Iranians have done in Syria. But they have not done the same in Yemen. It is, it is cheap to say that there is a crisis because there is a, a direct uh, Iranian role. It's, it's a little easy. The true reason why this crisis is going on and on and on is that its external representation in the mind of Trump, it is an anti-Iran war. As long as they consider it an anti-Iran war, it's a good war for the US, it's a good war for Israel, it's a good war for Saudi Arabia, and no one in Europe there uh, oppose this. So the way out is that we come to an understanding of the war which is a little more balanced, 
Why did the negotiation fail until now, whether in Oman or everywhere? Because the platform of negotiation was that the Zaydis should go back to the north, hand all their weapons, and go back to the situation of 2014. It is impossible. So the way out is some pressure of the international community to consider that there is no military solution and that the negotiation will have, whether we like it or not, to take into consideration a realistic understanding of the balance of forces. Thank you very much, Dr. Hiba. Uh, Professor Joseph Lombard, um, we've been talking about histories of uh, coexistence and sectarianism, uh, reviving sectarianism, inventing sectarianism, depending on the case. And you wrote about the, the, the role of tradition and how tradition, our tradition historically uh, was betrayed by different religious groups. And how do you see the, the importance of religious uh, discourse, the, the reform of religious discourse hand in hand with political discourses of sort of reconciliation, peace, justice, so, so how do I see religious discourse going hand in hand with political discourse? In political reform. With political, with political yeah. reform. And how can we sort of put a bet on our tradition that was betrayed by different groups or abused, and how this history can actually become a starting point for peace and reconciliation and, and search for justice? Well, I think that uh, in our current circumstances, I mean, there there have always been. Uh, ulama who have chosen uh, to be the tools of power. And, uh, and we now, I believe, have, I mean, I, I, I haven't done a historical count, so I'm speaking from, uh, you know, the provincialism of the present, as we always are. Um, but uh, we now have, uh, I think, uh, an overabundance of, uh, of ulama who are uh, willing to be the hands of power. And part of this has happened as a process whereby um, under the nation state model, um, the, uh, many of the institutions of, uh, of traditional learning have been co-opted by the state and many of the awqaf have been even stolen. Um, by the state, and the process of stealing the awqaf um, created the ulama as an underclass, um, and uh, and removed the ulama as a as a potential uh, force of opposition uh, in many parts of the Islamic world, and this is a situation from which uh, from which we now suffer, um, and and so we don't have uh, enough ulama who are willing to um, be the ones who oppose uh, power, and a lot of them getting involved in politics, and sometimes not understanding the degree to which they have become the pawns of politics. Because if you get into the political arena with a politician, and you don't know how the game's played, you're gonna be played. And so, as a result, people get played. Um, and uh, and this is where I think that uh, that um, uh, it happens with uh, with many of the ulama in the United States who try to come from the outside and try to say things about things that are happening in different parts of uh, of the Islamic world and uh, and unfortunately I mean I don't want to name names and astaghfirullah because some of these people are people for whom I at times uh, had great respect for um, and who I've even in some situations sat at their feet and learned from them. Um, and now they've gone to a situation where you know almost um, every fatwa is voicing the vindictive and vitriolic position of the state in which they in which they now live. And why, do, why do you think that is? I, I think it's because I think it's because of uh, because um, uh, well one thing like I said I think a lot of a, a lot of ulama really don't know the game of politics as well as they think that they do. It's ignorance. What's that? You think it's ignorance? I don't think it's it's in, it's in, it's it's always ignorant. So I'm not trying to give them um, uh, a, 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 a I'm not trying to give them an out uh, by saying that. Um, but a lot of times, you know, when when you, it's like they say, you know, when you're sitting at the table and you don't know who the mark is, you're the mark. Um, and so a lot of times you have they come to the table and and they don't realize that they're the ones who are actually being played into voicing um, the position of the political powers. Um, and which is actually working for 
in situations the oppression of the people. And this unfortunately is happening particularly in Egypt uh, under Sisi. Um, and uh, so this is where I actually think that, that the, a point where some ulama would withdraw uh, a little bit more and, and, and to go back to that uh, a situation where in the pre-modern world the ulama was more of a separate class that produced the legal system to which the state was then beholden. That's really the situation that, 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 that we need, and it's hard to get to it because those who hold power would have to give up power for that to happen. Very well. Uh, Dr. Brut, you are an economic historian, and Turkey has in the past uh, few weeks or few months has experienced um, an economic downturn, especially with the, with the valuation of the lira. Do you see this because of there are some structural problems with the economy of, of Turkey, or is it more an outside uh, interference, or is it a combination, or how do you assess the situation? It seems that uh, it's because of uh, the uh, recent or last decades of uh, political economic development and uh, to the stable situation of Turkey. And as you know, Turkey has some aims for 2023, 2053, 2071, you know, a millennial perspective. And uh, as economic historian, I would like to also uh, stress that after, you know, the abolish of uh, the Ottoman Empire, uh, the topics and issues we discussed here today for more than 80 years, all Islamic Ummah experienced such kind of things, you know. And Turkey, as first time, maybe after uh, 2002, uh, for a long time, in a long period, uh, experienced a stable situation comparing to the other Muslim countries and economic growth comparing to the Western and developed world was higher, you know. It's normal, but uh, more important comparing to the, you know, emerging economies. Uh, there are you know, we have uh, D7 and G7. In D7, uh, Turkey, in G7, uh, Turkey uh, in recent years also uh, had some good scores comparing to after China. Uh, the economic growth was, you know, uh, coming behind China. And so uh, it seems that uh, this new presidential system uh, will give some uh, strong support, you know, to realize these aims for Turkey. And, you know, uh, you know, there is, uh, you know, management, my theory maybe before some of my colleagues hear from me, Ottoman uh, abolish was not because of the failure of economy or the failure of technology or the failure in science, but it was because of the failure of uh, management, because of the failure of, you know, uh, we, uh, we are still discussing the same issues. They divided us and we followed their, you know, arguments and their issues. We uh, so, but first time Turkey come to the point, uh, focus on, you know, its own agenda, its own aims for uh, its country, for the region, and for Islamic and also for the world. So that means it was a kind of, you know, this dynamics and this operation uh, came from abroad. But fortunately, now, you know, after three months, uh, I can say that now, you know, dollar, uh, U.S. dollar reached to 7.4. Uh, 
uh, but now it's, you know, uh, 5.8. It's very clear, it's not... So, so how do you, because, because uh, we hear there's, Turkey has 240 plus billion dollars of debt and there will be a problem paying it and is that something that you are worried about or is there, is there a plan, real plan, that we will not have this uh, turbulation again? Private plus uh, government, so because it's the, even the private is guaranteed by government. Is it foreign? So, uh, uh, you know, again, uh, when this party came to the power in 2010, the total debt of Turkey was higher than its GDP. Uh, but now, yeah, as a percentage. So uh, from that time, you know, now it's uh, uncomparable successful on this issue, both for uh, domestic and for foreign, for private and for public. So normally, comparing to European economic powers or U the members of European Union, uh, Turkey is really, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, they have mastery criteria for their economies. Turkey is uh, very sweet for mastery uh, criteria still on this issue. And, uh, you know, if you have nearby one trillion U.S. dollar a GDP, uh, that figure two billion dollar is nothing for a country, you know, uh, when you look at, to, let's say, United States, yes. its foreign debt is you know, uncomparable, but also we have some countries like Turkey, they have double, or nearby there, you know, uh, UK, France, also have Italy, Spain, you know, Portuguese, they have, uh, you know, comparing to Turkey there. But nowadays, so after Turkey, we will focus again to these countries, what they are doing in their economies. Because Turkey uh, succeeded and now I hope uh, they can manage it and leadership is uh, successful nowadays. The difference, of course, that the U.S. can print its own money, we can't. Uh, very quickly, Mujib, if you have a comment about this and then Hiba will, will take it over. The comment about the uh, economic crisis? About, no, about Turkey in general, the, the, the pressures and the foreign uh, interference or interference, as you see it, how, how it's you, affecting uh, the overall situation. How do you see it from the outside? Yeah. Sure. Uh, actually, you know, I was recently at a SETA panel in Washington, D.C., and uh, the Ambassador James Jeffries was uh, on the panel with me. And um, what was clear was that what the U.S. is uncomfortable with is the fact that Turkey is asserting a regional leadership role. And uh, they find that unacceptable that Turkey should sort of return to its old horizons and, and to sort of assert itself to bring sort of stability and order to this region. And, you know, Turkey, of course, doesn't have a choice because the sort of Misaki Mili arrangement is no longer workable. Even if you want to avoid the Middle East, the Middle East will come to you, as we see with the terrible wars, it's unfortunate refugees coming across the border. So Turkey has no choice but to try to bring stability and order to the region. But um, that upsets the global balance of power. Uh, it, it's partly you know, related to American economic uh, and financial interests, but a lot of it's ideological and it's linked to Israel, as we've been discussing, uh, because uh, uh, the efforts against Turkey uh, to uh, rupture the relations with the United States was very much directed by groups like American Enterprise Institute, uh, uh, Foundation for Defense of Democracies, and so on. Uh, you know, the whole um, issue of um, uh, hostage diplomacy, as they call it, and sanctions on Turkey, Turkish banks and officials, uh, that was actually started by the Foundation for Defense of Democracies and its personnel who were working in the U.S. Treasury Department. Um, and so it, a lot of it had to do very much, and we saw this campaign and this influence perception operation against Turkey, against President Erdogan and so on. It began very much after Mavi Marmara. Some people um, dated to Davos one minute, but I think it was actually after Mavi Marmara because you clearly see a sudden rupture. Um, now, what options does Turkey have? I think um, Turkey does have options because we're no longer in a bipolar 
uh, a, uh, um, uh, international system. And um, Turkey refused to be a client state even when at the height of the Cold War. It asserted its, it, when it came to Cyprus and other sort of red lines. So now I think the situation for Turkey actually, and the U.S. realizes it, it's, it's, it has more room to operate because we are very much in a multipolar world. And uh, China, for example, very much sees Turkey as crucial for its Belt and Road Initiative and as the Western terminus of its attempt at integrating Eurasia. Russia, the same way. That's why Putin is courting Turkey so often uh, and so diligently. And so I think Turkey needs to stay that course, which is to say that, you know, we'll work with the United States when it comes to bringing peace and stability to this region, but when we need to look for friends elsewhere, uh, we will do that too. Um, let me take the uh, um, political and also economic uh, sort of ideas and, and move to a dimension that uh, we started actually the, the conference with, which was the history, the historical, and, the, and also the imaginary, the, how the expression, how the literary expression, how the artistic expression were part and parcel of forming the nationalist uh, mentality and then also the sectarian ones. Of course, we have seminal works, uh, seminal books that contributed to that, or discourses, or fatwas, or khutbas, or whatever you call it. But in, in, in our current time, there are new generations with hybrid identities that are expressing their affiliation with these isms in a different way. And Professor Nagihan, can you shed a bit of light on how do you see the contemporary engagement of uh, uh, different uh, types of uh, artistic and literary expression, being a professor of uh, English literature? And uh, of course, you also teach Orientalism and other things, and, and you show your students films. And so how do you see this realm, the, the realm of these ideas and the realms of these ideas from the level of the artistic expression and how is the future of that? Because we have the social media, we have, it's a different world after 100 years of the emergence of all these isms, basically. Um, I don't um, work on the Muslim Ummah per se as my colleagues here sort of work on the European Ummah, so to speak, and I'm very much interested in European identity because, I mean, Muslim identity has been sort of discussed and um, sort of uh, analyzed, maybe overanalyzed. Um, but I actually want to take the discussion back to your panel um, and I, um, the idea of a um, of fragile, well, when we look at the, um, the various isms here, the, the idea of a very fragile uh, secularism, that's what interests me. And I want, I, I'm interested in how that finds voice in um, European literature. And of course, um, secularism, as has been discussed, is a very much sort of associated with France. So uh, the idea of secularism um, sort of is discussed differently in Britain and France. And if you're going to discuss secularism, you need to look at French literature most of the time and um, to see how um, French world of letters is perceiving secularism to be um, in peril. And I like that you've got peril there, but actually Europeans themselves, of course, see themselves as in peril and this idea, and you've got colonialism there. Um, we're talking about the, the heritage of colonialism in the Middle East, but of course Europeans now consider themselves being colonized by the Muslims themselves. And I've done some work on particularly uh, Michel Welbeck's work. Um, some of you may have heard of him. I mean, um, I mean, I think really, I mean, his book really just sums up the European fears of this Europe being colonized and secularism being fragile. Um, you, you may know the book is about how in France a uh, Muslim president comes to power. Now, on the face of it, it looks like a, an Islamophobic um, sort of narrative. But, I mean, this was also sort of partially being discussed as, you know, what the, where does the left fit into this picture? I mean, basically, um, Welbeck is um, accusing the leftists and the liberals for making this happen, not so much the Muslims themselves. So uh, the idea, and, uh, and again, I want to co connect it to your kind of idea of secularism as well. When we talk about secularism, um, we always sort of see it in the sort of dichotomy of Muslims on one side and secularists on one side. But, you know, what's happening within the secularist itself? And 
secularism as an anti-Muslim or anti-immigrant uh, power seems almost dated now, given that you know we are in a very kind of anti-intellectual um, environment. So you know you don't get those kinds of sort of informed secular critique of the Muslim communities. It's more kind of this uninformed sort of quasi-religious. Uh, critique that you get rather than this kind of secularist. So, um, so I'm trying to look at those narratives out there to see, you know, whether people still pit the secularists against the Muslims or are there other powers that are pitted against one another, represented in books that kind of define, um, yeah, the discourses, the, uh, the, where, where, the, where the fighting lines are, I would say. I think, uh, uh, Professor, um, when you talked about um, uh, how it, uh, Turkey is seen from the outside, it's also about how it's imagined. It's imagined by the public image, by the media. So how do you see um, Turkey presenting itself beyond the stereotypes uh, from the outside? You know, because sometimes um, uh, this uh, sort of Ottoman accusation of trying to draw on Ottoman history, etc., uh, leads people to I mean, any, um, moving away from, from that. Uh, and sometimes it's necessary to just refer to your own history. You mentioned that sometimes you refer to pre-Islamic history even. So how do you, th how do you think that in the future, uh, and with the situation in Europe and this rising Islamophobia and also racist uh, uh, trends, uh, Europe would be facing uh, the future uh, like decade or so? Which discourse are you yani, seeing developing? So the last part I'd like to build on because it's uh, actually also follows on um, Nagyan's uh, uh, comments uh, on France and the rest of Western Europe. Um, first, historical memory about what Europe is and was, how it's reconstructed. Why is it a Christian Europe? I mean, that's a very that's a very peculiar. Uh, uh, construction Bias. of European identity, and I'll try to give some examples from how it terribly poisons, uh, you know, Western European politics, whether it's French or, um, uh, or, or, or Austrian or, or others. For example, um, France today has by far the largest Muslim minority in absolute and relative terms in the Western world. Mm -hmm. Something like 8 9%, maybe 10 uh, In Assemblée Nationale, if French Muslims were proportionately represented, they would have 49 or 50 Muslim origin members of the parliament. There were zero in 2010, four in the 2014 cycle, and eight now thanks to the quick success of Macron by some sort of accident almost. Eight instead of 50. And if you subdivide the community into, let's say, um, I don't like to reaffirm these categories, but let's say more religiously observant, center, leftist, as if we would do you know, liberal reform, etc., zero representation of, let's say, the religious conservative segment, even though about 39, 40% of French Muslims, for example, report praying five times a day, um, fasting during Ramadan, uh, and so on and so forth, you would not find a, a mainland uh, French Muslim MP, nothing like a Sadiq Khan of London in French politics, in German politics, in Swedish politics, in Danish politics, even though all of these countries have Muslim minorities of three to five to eight percent. So there's that kind of political segregation that is continent-wide. Worse is the discourse that Muslims are somehow alien, that they are immigrants. What makes French Muslims immigrants when Algeria was annexed and occupied in 1830 and annexed in the, that's uh, 185 years ago, that's earlier than southwestern France joined France. Which generation is this? 10th, 15th generation of French Muslims? So this discourse, and it is uh, ubiquitous in scholarship, indigenous minority, autochthon minority versus immigrant, is a cover for discrimination. 
if a person is fifth, sixth generation, even second generation uh, uh, French, Italian, German, Muslim, why say that uh, her or his underrepresentation uh, is not like the underrepresentation of an indigenous minority? We would be, I mean, I have, in fact, for a CETA report, I, I, I made this comparison. We would be appalled, for example, if US House of Commons didn't have any African American. Senate didn't, but that's already appalling for, you know, electoral reasons, that not a single of the Jewish or Catholic or Orthodox Christian members of the house ever is reported attending Sunday service or Shabbat or synagogue, because that is the ultra-secular profile of Muslim representatives in French, German, Danish, Swedish, Norwegian parliaments. That one segment of the minority is completely, and the minority as a whole is mostly excluded, segregated. So what's the way out? Uh, well, one is to publicize. I mean, what we don't see, what I'm still ho hoping to see, but can't see, is a European-wide civil rights movement. <laughs> Where is the equivalent of MLKs and Malcolm X's, of French, German... It's, it's civil rights movement usually are led by people who are victims, not victimizers. So, I mean... No, by, the, the, by the underrepresented exactly. uh, women and the, minorities. Yeah, from, from among that community yeah. who's probably in fear, at least in the United States, living in fear. But in the, in the, you know, unfortunately, a lot of them are co-opted. Those yes, who are. So I, I would imagine that was the story of any civil rights movement in the beginning, before it began. The second part, which I didn't want to forget, uh, is the historical recovery part. I didn't present it here because it uh, seems completely irrelevant. But um, the Muslim history, Jewish history of Europe, is very much recovered now. Muslim history of Europe, that Sicily was Muslim for 250 years, that Palermo had 300 mosques, uh, that, uh, you know, uh, in 1200, five of the uh, most populous uh, Western European cities included at least two Muslim cities, Sevilla and Palermo, uh, and um, was it Granada? I need to check the demography. Three, actually, not two, three. Uh, all of this is not part of canonical European history textbooks. Thanks to the recovery, you know, the amendment of Christian civilization as Judeo-Christian civilization, we at least learned that there were also Jews who, prior to the Second World War, were also written off European history, but not Islamic history. Not Sicily, not, not, yeah. not Southern Italy. Uh, that would be... Uh, so I think these two both have an academic dimension and an activist publicity dimension. Uh, uh, legislative representative politics, and you said, why wouldn't they mobilize? When would they mobilize when the wave of uh, constitutional, uh, in the uh, Swiss case uh, for minarets, or legal bans against uh, Muslim and Jewish circumcision have been passed or about to pass in almost all Scandinavian countries, ban against ritual animal uh, slaughter, which again affects both halal and kosher meat, from Poland, to Belgium, to Netherlands, to Germany, there, there's uh, successful and half successful attempts. There is a, uh, there is a series, it's like a domino effect, there's a series of uh, legal bans which <coughs> under normal conditions would go to uh, maybe not United Nations but all kinds of international bodies Thank you. as, uh, as uh, infringement of uh, religious rights. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Dr. Safi, um, You've been part of the Arab world for a long time. You've been observing Turkey for a long time. You have seen uh, the AK party uh, exper experiment here and their success with electoral politics. Do you think the, exper the Turkish experiment is, uh, could work in the Arab context and how, if, if you think so? Yeah, I mean, that's an excellent question because <clears throat> uh, in 2000, 13, I published a book. In one chapter, I looked about models for um, Muslim Arab society to emulate. And, and so Turkey and Iran were, were these two models. Of course, um, I inclined toward the Turkish model of trying to um, live Islamic values and not to carry the Islamic um, huh? banner, you know? We are Muslims, we are Muslims, but then when we act, we act like anybody, you know, sometimes, you know, like anybody else, we be worse. Because the focus is on the 
a facade, the, the, the outside. I'm not, of course, saying that we should abandon anything that is symbolic if we believe it's part of our identity. So that's another, <laughs> that's not my suggestion. But my suggestion is should not really um, keep talking about calling everything that we like Islamic, 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 and then we don't understand how Islam relates to it. It's not by calling it Islamic, it becomes Islamic. So I believe that the, the uh, AK, AK party was able to embrace some Islamic values and try to introduce them into political uh, you know, reality of Turkey. And I guess by that they became um, acceptable uh, by everybody because they were working for the betterment of people. Um, not only the Muslim or the Mu'mineen or the our people. So it's for everybody. So this is really the essence what the Islamic message has always been about. So I think, yeah, I think the, the, the AK party, um, through long experience and, of course, a number of conditions that were, were combined to bring out this experiment, um, uh, I think it has been... so. So, so your answer is yes. So the so, answer so, is so, uh, how? So, so I think for you know this is really my project now. Uh, I have been writing about that a lot. I would like to see Islam first and foremost in the public square, be understood through values, through ethics, public ethics, which we really we don't have it. Um, our our seminary, our Sharia our schools don't teach it. Our khutbah never talk about public you know work ethics. I never heard one sermon in any Arab world people talk about work ethics, how we have to behave in our work, or ethics with, with, the, with the neighbor or with the, with the other, you know, whoever the other is. That is, what we see is really this um, try to uh, bring, look at Islam through the surface text picked through the method. Who, who would be the carriers, the messengers of this message? Academics? Shifts, well, academics, imams? unfortunately, academics, I would say activist scholars or scholar activists. Uh, well, imams, to do that, we have to change the curriculum of, the, of, the, of those colleges. I have looked into them and I wrote about them. These, these kind of curriculum will not produce a person who is able to lead in modern Let's time. Let's ask Dr. Bulut, you're a president of university. Can we produce activist scholars? Can I add something? Yes. So uh, I just, uh, this is a very good point uh, for uh, today Muslims, Islamic countries. Uh, the main problem is we are not living for doing Ahsan Amala. We were created for that reason, you know. You know, Bismillah, الذي خلق الموت والحياة ليبلوكم أيكم أحسن عملا. But we, in our jobs, we have to do at least better. You know, if it's possible, the best, what we are doing. So it's starting from the point that uh, Professor raised, it's starting from the ethics, ethical issues. You know, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that as a last messenger, I was sent to complete mukarrami akhlaq. So that's the point. But what the governments can do, the government just can, you know, uh, prepare regulations, free atmosphere. So, you know, for them is, you know, to ta'muruna bin ma'ruf wa tanhawna anil munkar. Then, scholars, thinkers, uh, civil societies. The role of university? Of course, the role of university, all the institutions. Uh, we have to prepare our generation for the future. What does it mean today? The needs of society is different than the yesterday, than the past. There are so many, you know, issues for youth, for young generation. We have to prepare them for the future with, you know, but the main thing is good ethics.
yes. than the ability to do their jobs as the best, at least better than the other one. Francois, what about Western uh, institutions? Do they have any role in, in ethics and in, in, in going back to the, to, the, um, to, to the principles that they espoused in the Enlightenment? Or is it something now that we came to the point where this, this relativism goes all the way? How do you see things progressing in France, at least? They are not progressing in France. They are not. <laughs> Especially in light of Tariq Ramadan, if you want to comment about you know, this, this horrible situation. No, the, um, I don't think that there is a, a space for specificity for the EU institutions. I mean, the EU institutions are the addition of, uh, of, uh, of the members. Uh, so I, I'm not expecting a, a resistance coming from the EU institution. Now, if you want a few sentences on, <laughs> on the Tarek Ramadan situation, I would rather speak of uh, Tarek Ramadan on the side of this present situation, because we, we don't need it. Uh, what was uh, very significant was the treatment of Tarak Ramadan before this affair. Yes. This affair, we would need a, a few minutes to go through the... But before the affair, if you wanted to, um, to destroy my own legitimacy, Francois Berger, all you had to say, friend of Tarak Ramadan, hmm. And it was finished. You disconnect your, your brain, you plug in your guts. Um, so I would say the treatment of Tarek Ramadan before this uh, situation, now it, it has worsened, but just before, is the perfect example of the inability of uh, the, at least the French society, even more, I think it's worse than France, to admit um, a clean process of representing the Muslims in the society. Is there as a role I, to the inter, of the as I said, as I said uh, yesterday in my talk, we have a, a speciality. Mm -hmm. We want fake Muslim elite. We produce fake Muslim elites. We want Hakim al Qarawi who will tell us what we want to hear in the language which we like. And, and this is a trend which is not only inside the society. Some of my punchlines, you know, when I was in front of the Senate, um, I said, oh, President uh, Hollande went to La Marsa yesterday afternoon. Next time, I wish he would visit Tunisia. What did I mean? Whenever we go to um, a, a, a country, we meet with the tiny fringe of the society, speaks French, uh, uh, shares our uh, hate of uh, the Islamic movement, uh, so this is the case. So Tarek Ramadan was exactly what France could not accept. Someone playing tennis much better than you and I, uh, a fluent, eloquent, and, and uh, capable of facing any situation in, in the media. Thank you. So, Thank you very much. We have exactly 24 minutes left. So each one is going to get three minutes closing statement. Um, what I would like you to address, if possible, is where do you see things positively in the future? What should be done either at the individual level or at the intellectual level, at the university professor level, or at whatever level you want, society level? Just give us a, uh, something hopeful we can look up to. And I'm going to start with Dr. Musulli, and then we give one and one and all the way back. So three minutes each. Yes, uh, I think I'll continue what we were talking about. I think the role of the, that ulama played historically is gone now. They are not part of the, you know, uh, organic intellectual that have been able to move and so on. We need new intellectuals. We need new thinkers. We need new institutions. We have to produce knowledge. I'm not saying we cut off ourselves of the world. No, we should take it. We should learn from it. We should move it ahead. I'm not, with all of the problem, I'm not very, I'm not pessimistic, I'm optimistic, but we have to do it. I think Turkey is a very good example of learning from the past, taking from the West, moving forward, and if it keeps doing this, and if it ties up to other countries, and have a big 
process of knowledge, industrialization, and working slowly, progressively, moving forward, we can do something. The too much ideologies and re-Islamization talk and uh, under-Islamization, over-Islamization, uh, to talking about how to make a good wudu, how to do all of this. We should, uh, we should go beyond all of this. What I'm saying, we have to re re-envision our, uh, re our future. What we want, enough, we have too much past. We have our uh, honorable past, but enough is enough. That like one is talking about his grandfather all of the time, but he's dead. He's finished. You know, I want to talk about my grandson, who is not born yet. I'm not that old, so I want to talk about my uh, grandson, what he should live, what he should do, what should learn, what kind of sciences. Of course, at times we were producers of science. You talked about it yesterday. Uh, whether at the level of epistemology, whether at the level of sciences. You cannot be pro productive in one field and fail in all other fields. It's impossible. They are tied up to a vision of who we are, what we are, what we want to do. Politics is not the primary thing that should be the moving force behind reimagining our civilization. It's all imagination, where we go, what to do. And uh, in the, our discourse has been in the 19th, 20th century about remembering the past and reinforce it in the present in order to screw up the future. <laughs> Thank you. what we have done. Dr. Wright. Uh, well, I would like first to say that I often hear, particularly in this part of the world, that power protects people. I think this is a wrong understanding of power. People create power. Power starts with people. People are the source of power and not really the, the one who are protected by power. And so I think what we need to do really to change things not to try to, to look at current powers and see how they can help us, but we have to see whether we can discover the power in ourselves as society, as communities. And at the heart of that, I believe, is Islam for Muslim societies. It's Christianity for Christian societies. It's Judaism for Jewish society. This is not my own invention. Go read Toynbee, go read before him um, Weber, Max Weber. Read society, uh, economy and society. All modernization throughout history and all religions starts with the prophetic period where a new generation of people don't have to be prophets, but people who have prophetic vision try to bring new values that energize the society and then rationalization comes afterward. This modernization process comes afterward. In fact, you know, I do rem remember reading Afghani, uh, you know, he wrote an article a century and a half uh, ago. He was informing or trying to argue with the statesman of his time. He said, you know, all these technological things you are trying to import will not help our societies without a new philosophy. And that's what we need. We, knew, we need to have a new vision as, as a society. I don't think our imams who are graduated from the current seminaries or Sharia schools are able to do that because all they are trained to look at the past and glorify it and relive it or try to bring it back to our time. And the past, of course, it has the text which is revealed, but it has the interpretation which has made by human beings who lived in particular uh, time. So what I'm suggesting here is that what we need is our scholars, our intellectuals to start to, to understand Islam, not of course, we have to read those texts. I mean, we can't jump over the past. We have to understand the past. But we have to look at the future. We have to envisage and imagine Islam that is much more viable than the, pa the past Islam. Thank you. In, in many ways. So I think that's my hope. And of course, if I can conclude with this, I think really eventually we need an in intellectual movement that is 
working with the social movement, not in, in, in opposition or separate from the social movement. We have to find how our intellectual uh, uh, you know, production or development or creativity can be filtered down to the people. That's what the selfie movement, movement has succeeded, really, because it produces people who can interact with society. And eventually, what happened to us, we were, were all reading the Quran in a very uh, you know, surface way, surface text, in a very cherry-picking way. And that's really a disaster. So we have to bring a new vision, new movement that understand the core of Islam, its values, and translate them into institutions and actions and relationships Thank you. In now and here. Thank you very much, Dr. Bulut. Uh, I am very optimistic, by the way. Uh, the Muslim countries, Islamic countries, has, uh, has huge potential. Young generation, young population. Just we need first to do our job better, as I stressed before. Uh, by personally, we have to represent uh, what we are, who we are. As institutions, we have to do our better. As universities, as economic institutions, as governments. So we missed 20th century. Because of what? We lose something 100 years ago. By the way, heritage is very important. Tradition is very important. We have to connect these days to our tradition. Without our tradition, heritage, civilization, it's impossible to say anything for the future. So that means this generation needs to cover our tradition based on tradition, but understand today and concrete a new you know, way for the future. So, uh, in 20th century, why we missed that century? Because we could not find enough time to take wudu, to pray, uh, because of we had to fight with each other and with the shaitans. So, so the, the brother give example as a Turkey. Take as example as a Turkey. Till recent decades, Turkey lose, loses energy. You know, without we, with headcraft, it was impossible to join to the school, to do any job at public level or at you know in, in the government level. So, can you imagine you are losing half of your energy? And at home, at home, every day you are busy with different things. You could not concentrate on your own. You cannot use energy as efficiency, you know. So, let me finish by stressing that uh, from starting the modern age, you know, uh, the Western civilizations start to rise. And they declared that rise of the West, decline of the rest. They based this tradition on, you know, the faith and the God was out of the life. So philosophy increased, analysis, everything based on, you know, reason. They created a civilization. We as Muslims, so many problems are solved in our tradition. You know, the Prophet Muhammad solved the main problems, you know, for philosophy I'm taking about. We just need, you know, to live in, uh, in the fut futra, you know, in the Sunnatullah. So, uh, as personally, as family, this Western civilization, now it's in the harbor that create crisis. Personally, fighting mind and heart. Crea created crisis in family, divorce, living alone, created crisis in economy. You know what's happening 
in the, you know, in financial system, in economic system, created in political life, in social life, we experience that this system is creating just conflict. Some societies will fight and they will, you know, continue to rise. So, uh, finishing, we have a big potential, just, just need to recover again what is real Islam, escape from extremism. We need Sunnatullah, Ehli Sunnah, well, Jama'ah, it's important. We lose something and take into consideration that 100 years ago, how they divided us, because how Salafis, how Wahhabism came to our world, we have to take about that, we have to think about that. And now they are again supporting that kind of movements. We know who support Al-Qaeda, we know who support you know, these extremist fighters. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Dr. Akhturk. Uh, thank you. So I'm a comparativist, so I'll try to be optimistic uh, comparatively and then pessimistic. Uh, I actually started out primarily as a Russianist and Soviet uh, scholar, so when I looked to the Middle East as an outsider, at least as a scholar, of course I studied Turkey too, but not the uh, uh, Arab Middle East, I thought this is great potential for democracy. What is happening with Arab Spring is 1989. Uh, one after the other, Poland, Czech, Romanian, Bulgarian Communist parties collapse within a year. That's what will happen with military dictatorships, Ba'athist and otherwise in Egypt, in Syria, in Tunisia, in all of them. Like what I discussed, and uh, I was very, uh, I was very, I still think the big struggle is democracy versus non-democracy, majority rule versus non-majority rule. I have not uh, backed off from that position at all. And what made me even more optimistic for a country like Egypt or, uh, or uh, Syria or many other Middle Eastern countries compared to, let's say, a Belarus or, a, or an Uzbekistan was that there wasn't a totalitarian regime that smothered all societal distinctions and pluralism, churches and mosques and private sector and everything, that we can't really have a multi-party system uh, because there is nothing left uh, in this atomized, very homogenized society, whereas in Syria, in, uh, in uh, Egypt, elsewhere, in, uh, uh, in the uh, Arab and non-Arab Middle East, there's a lot of resources for multi-party politics, which is the primary advantage I saw of Turkey as opposed to not just, let's say, Egypt, but also as opposed to Russia, as opposed to Iran. You look at Istanbul, um, you know, St. Petersburg, Cairo, Tehran in 1905, 1908, when each of them had a vibrant, pluralist society, constitutional revolutions in three of them, but only one of them, and that is the luck of Turkey, kept having more or less elections, even though ruptured by three, four brutal military dictatorships, whereas Soviet Union degenerated into totalitarian dictatorship, Iran, you know, unfortunately with the overthrow of Mossadegh, which was my very short and only kind of master's thesis on the Middle East was the overthrow of Mossadegh, Egypt also military dictatorships. And I thought this is the advantage of Turkey vis-a-vis -vis all of these, and this is what we should preserve, at least two major political traditions. I can go to any town in Turkey and identify the Republican versus the Democrat going back five, six generations because there has been a multi-party politics. And I was very hopeful about the Arab Spring for that reason. What I discounted, and, I, I, and as a, as a non-expert, I, I excuse myself because uh, I can't discount it, was that external actors were so invested in crushing these popular uprisings, whether it's the Russian Air Force or the American Air Force, which have partitioned 90% of Syria for their own uh, proxy states, whether it's the funding of you know, uh, the Egyptian military coup, uh, or the Iranian proxies, that this was not a case for Poland, for Czech, for Romania, for Bulgaria. When they transitioned to democracy, the uh, Soviet Union revoked the Brezhnev Doctrine specifically, saying that we will never intervene to overthrow your elected government. But, so this is, this, is the, this is the cause for pessimism, is that I don't see the international configuration there is no great power, there is no UN Security Council member that is committed to majority rule in any major Arab or even non-Arab 
kind of Middle Eastern state at the moment. Thank you for your summer that's, note. That's very, that's very, yeah, that's the pessimism in me. Just. Thank you. Um, it's a very good question, and, and I think that it's it's very important because I think that you know it's part of our, our tradition as Muslims that one should never despair. Um, and uh, and in our current situation, I can really the place from which I can speak is my place as an academic. And uh, and uh, I think we tend to discount. You know, we speak about human rights and our activism and things that we should do, and we should be doing that. Our 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 actions should have real impact in the real world. But at the same time, when we look at the situation under which we live now, these situations began with small groups of intellectuals in particular places. The Enlightenment did not begin with some wide-scale movement of hundreds of academics all over. It began with a very small group. We had the same thing with the scientific revolution. It's a very small group. We look, for example, at, at Baghdad. I mean, these are small groups of intellectuals that then grow out. We look at, you know, when people have referred to Basra as the hub of the, of the, the first creation of, of of the intellectual sciences in Islam. It's incredible how much intellectual activity had there and how much that still influences us today. The point here is that we can do that. We have the capacity in Muslim institutions for Muslim scholars to get together and to create epistemic visions that are counter-hegemonical, that we can really, we can go against this, we can create completely different intellectual visions that will have real world consequences. We could say right now that, for example, the environmental crisis can be directly traced to the placement of the human being as, the view of the human being as homo economicus or homo deus, the, both of the terms together, and the human being as a sovereign detached from God and not bound necessary to, tran to transcendental principles, but ultimately to utilitarian principles. Now that all comes back to a world view. Within the classical Islamic tradition, within the, the original texts, we have the tools to counter that. We haven't developed it. I haven't seen a single really good paper on a Quranic theology of the environment. The issue of pluralism. We have, within the classical tradition, excellent tools for uh, discussing many of the issues, uh, particularly of religious pluralism, that confront us. And yet it's not developed in a refined way. We have classical texts where some scholars have discussed, and we have studies that say, oh, so-and-so said this, oh, so-and-so said that, oh, so-and-so said that. We had great intellectuals, alhamdulillah. All right, let's all go, go smoke a shisha. You know, that's just, that, that doesn't work, all right? We need to say, okay, based upon that, and what they, what they developed upon, what can we now do to apply those particular teachings in the contemporary condition? And that requires institutions, and that requires funding. Thank you, thank you. Would you? <laughs> thank you. <laughs> well, uh, people seem to be mentioning both pessimism and optimism, so to uh, reference a uh, well-known um, uh, uh, quote from uh, Gramsci, uh, concerning uh, which Edward Said was often f fond of citing uh, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. So you know, we we have setbacks, uh, as Shanner mentioned, re referencing the Arab Spring. Um, but uh, the fact that that process unfold, uh, unfolded itself, and that it started, you know, with a merchant in Tunisia, and it involved uh, millions of people rising up. Um, that spirit is still there. And um, I think it'll go forward. And um, so uh, we need to develop those sorts of democratic politics and that um, uh, ref social moral reflexivity that comes with um, having um, a critical approach to one's own shortcomings and openness to diverse, diverse opinions and um, pluralistic ways of being. Uh, and uh, we had this approach to Islamic modernity a hundred years ago, you know, and in my presentation I was talking about what went wrong in terms of Sykes-Picot and the fragmentation of the region. And I'm thinking uh, specifically of a modernism associated with Namik Kamal, uh, Ibrahim Sinashi, um, Khairuddin Tun Tunisi, uh, Muhammad Iqbal, uh, Jamaluddin al um that avoided either the absolute alienation and deracination that was attempted by throwing out our own historic legacy in the form of high Kemalism, for example, Pahlavism, Borgibism, which all basically ended in a dead end, or this 
retreat into Salaf this constructed myth of authenticity around various forms of Salafism, Wahhabism. <coughs> so that's one thing. Then there's a practical thing I think that's also um, necessary, which is that um, how do we reconnect then this the, uh, and undo this frag regional fragmentation that took place? And I think you know there's a political and economic dimension to this. It's very much also tied to democratic politics. But I do I am optimistic. I see Turkey playing a leading role in this, of course, um, as it's reconnected with her own Seljuk and Ottoman past. And I and that I see Pakistan and you know democratic elections there working uh, to, towards that uh, in Malaysia as well. There was an attempt at a counter-revolution, a part of what happened in the Arab Spring. Uh, remember, this counter-revolution did fail. It failed July 2016 in Turkey. So there's an attempt to overthrow the democratically elected government, and it failed because the Turkish people turned out mm. by the millions, and it, it, no matter what <laughs> others wanted, it, it wasn't going to happen. It also failed in Malaysia because, again, the same actors, uh, Emirati Saudi royal families, were involved in embezzling some seven billion uh, from the Malaysian uh, MBD fund, and the corrupt prime minister Razak um, thought he could pull all the levers. And, 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 and stay in power. And this is you know, um, what many were hoping. But uh, democracy won, and Anwar Ibrahim, who's been a great champion, a great friend of Turkey as well, and an ally. So I see this, see this other side, the positive side, emerging, the counter-counter-revolution. So that's where my optimism comes in. Thank you. Nagaham? Yeah. Oh, um, Actually, I want to make two points about imams. Um, first, an anecdote. When the, um, the Syrian revolution started, I remember having a conversation with a leftist American academic, and she was very, it was a very heated debate, and at last she said, you know, either I'm going to take arms or I'm going to become an imam. To, you know, these are the two ways of actually influencing people. And the other thing um, I want to say, because you're talking about, uh, you know, you don't see the imams sort of giving that kind of value, um, but it would be interesting, I think, to compare what the hutbas are like, say, in Arab countries and Turkish, in the Turkish context, because I've been to Friday hutbas where they do actually talk about work ethic and the environment. So, I mean, it's not, I mean, we cannot lose hope in the imams. Um, and when it comes to my hopes, um, I, uh, well, we're, we've been talking about sort of the prophetic way. I think I sort of might um, unwittingly fall on the sort of humanist uh, side. I. I'm an intersectionalist, I guess, although sometimes it makes for very strange bedfellows. But this has also been mentioned that, you know, we don't have a sort of like an, uh, an Islamic view on the environment, for instance. I mean, we do have some of that. But, I mean, working in concert with the environmentalist movement, the workers' movement, that's where I see uh, the future. And the reason being, because when you look at the discourse of people who are antagonistic towards Muslims, I mean, Eventually, they always make some other mistake of, you know, being misogynistic, being anti-Jewish. You know, they always out themselves as being bad people, basically. So, as we, as long as we keep the intersectionality, I think there's there's hope. Thank you, uh, Francois. One, one sentence. I think the conclusion should come from the center. You know, because Ahmed, no, you are in the, the center. center, and we're going to end with the periphery. <laughs> no, if I. From an outsider point of view, uh, I was often asked, what should we do as Muslim? And, uh, and I, I, I have a joke, I said, uh, uh, in every uh, compartment of social activity, uh, first of all, you must be everywhere, you must be the best. You must be Zinedine Zidane in every compartment of uh, European societies, and we will uh, forget the crisis. So that, that would be, but I say it seriously, be everywhere and be the best and be patient. Thank you. Hiba. I'm a presenter. I, I'm not... Uh, yeah, I'm giving you the opportunity if you want to say a closing <laughs> word. Um, I, I, I just hope that the next conference we will see more youth on the, on the, on the stage. Thank you. Uh, I think that... <laughs> I think we should be seat, yani, sitting uh, uh, in the hall, commenting or um, sort of trying to uh, deal with the ideas presented uh, on the on the stage by youth. So I, I have a lot of hope in the youth, and I hope that um, 
يعني I give them, they give us energy, I, they give us hope, and they ask us for a way to go forward, and they look forward to us, and, and they look up to us and say, is there hope? I mean, they are the hope. So thank you for attending and for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much. For the past three days, we've been through um, several sessions and a couple of dozen speakers. I think they were enlightening, illuminating, insightful, thoughtful. Uh, we probably have more questions than answers. So we'll continue to examine, to think, to reflect, to write, to debate, to discuss, uh, to continue the conversation. And I echo uh, what uh, Heba said, that uh, we would like, as a community, as intellectuals, as society, to empower women and youth. Especially, they are the future, in my view, that we must uh, take care of them. They were also the spark of what is called the Arab Spring. Without them, there would never have been an Arab Spring, whether in Tunisia or Egypt, which also inspired the rest. And uh, the problem, of course, is that the, the older generation, uh, they were accustomed to, the, to, uh, to old ways. So this is something that we really need to think about and see how we can end on a hopeful note is, is, is indeed to empower the youth and the women. And on that note, I'd like to tell everybody that uh, one of the conferences we will hold next week, next um, year, I'm sorry, is, uh, is titled Social and Political Empowerment of Women in Muslim Societies. So uh, if you have any uh, people that you would like us to invite, uh, you're, you're welcome to, uh, to share them with us. Uh, lastly, I would like to thank uh, our staff and uh, volunteers for this incredible work that they put together uh, with this conference. Please give them a round of applause. Uh, please stand up our volunteers and our uh, staff. Yunus, Yunus has been the heart everywhere. Yes, thank you so much. And also I would like to thank the administration, Dr. Uh, Omar Uzbek and Dr. Mehmet Bulut also for incredible support. So until next year, thank you so much. Wassalamu alaikum. and speakers in about um, 45 minutes will have dinner, so we're not going to go to the hotel. We're going to go straight to dinner, 6.45.